everybody to today's webinar, What Makes Arts for Change Work Excellent. We are presenting today from the Ontario Trillium Foundation HQ in Toronto. And we have joining with us today Pam Corza from Americans for the Arts. So just as a, uh, to set the context for today's webinar, some of you may know the Ontario Trillium Foundation, some of you may not, but we're an agency of the Government of Ontario, and we're one of Canada's leading grant-making foundations. Uh, we have a budget of over $136 million, and we um, award grants to some 1,000 projects every year. And um, we are a leading public agency and partner in the public benefit sector. So uh, today's webinar, in part, is also an introduction to the Knowledge Center. So we've just, we've just launched this uh, online shared learning environment that will connect Ontario's nonprofit sector. We're offering the Knowledge Center as part of our commitment to support Ontario communities beyond the grants through our services to community work. So this online resource includes a discussion forum and access to reports and videos, infographics, and more to come. And over time, this resource library will grow, we hope, uh, with your help. The discussion forums mm -hmm. in the Knowledge Center centered around OTS six action areas, so active people, connected people, green people, inspired people, promising young people, and prosperous people. But we also have two additional discussions around um, evaluation and measurement and open data. So the discussion forms a virtual space for sharing stories, challenges, opportunities, and learning from each other. So this webinar kicks off the resource library on the Inspired People Hub in the Knowledge Center. And um, after today's webinar, we actually have a, a discussion opened up on the Inspired People um, Forum in the Knowledge Center to continue this conversation. And I'll, I'll make sure by the end of this webinar that you can find your way there. Very briefly, um, OTS, uh, as I mentioned, uh, invests in, in six different action areas. One of them is the Inspire People Action Area, um, and it's named for the impact that we'd like to have through our investments in arts, culture, and heritage. And you'll see this diagram um, outlines the priority outcomes and the grant results that guide our investments. Um, and the action area is, is all about enriching people's lives through arts, culture, and heritage. A key piece of this action area is moving people from being passive audience members to being active participants uh, in the creative process. And it's also based on the premise that participation in quality culture, heritage, and arts experiences leads to more connectedness within communities to an engaged public. Um, a big question that often comes up is how do we describe what's happening in these participatory arts experiences? And how do we describe the impact that this work is having? For this reason, I'm very excited about the work that PAM and Animating Democracy have done uh, to develop a framework that helps to describe the aesthetic attributes that can contribute to the artistic vibrancy and the, the social and civic effectiveness of arts for change work. So without further ado, I would like to introduce you to Pam Corza, who is the co-director of Animating Democracy, a project of Americans for the Arts. Um, Americans for the Arts is an organization that inspires, informs, promotes, and connects arts and culture as potent contributors to community, civic, and social change. And Animating Democracy's current work centers on building evaluation capacity of practitioners, funders, and other stakeholders to understand the impact of arts-based civic engagement and social change. Pam's writing and editing on assessing arts and social change work includes uh, the framework, Aesthetic Perspectives, Attributes of Excellence in Arts for Change, which you will become very familiar with today. Uh, also includes the Continuum of Impact Guide, um, which we will be presenting in a webinar next Tuesday. Um, evaluating Impact, Appreciating Evaluation is a chapter in the book Arts and Community Change that was published by Rutledge in 2015. Uh, she's also written Critical Perspectives, writing on art and civic dialogue, so <laughs> incredibly accomplished. Um, for nine years, she co-led the Assessing Practices in Public Scholarship Research Group of Imagining America. 
She's consulted and offered workshops and presentations on evaluation for the Center for Civic Practices Catalyst Initiative, Boston Artists in Residence Program, and on arts and civic engagement for artists, cultural organizations, funders, and at cross-sector gatherings across the country and in China and South Korea. And uh, without further ado, I present you Pam, who is joining us today from Amherst, Massachusetts. Great. Thank you so much, Liz. I'm um, truly delighted to uh, be with all of you today. I think I've been waiting for uh, a long time for evaluation to be kind of the sexy topic, and it seems to have gotten to that point. <laughs> Hopefully, it's a fun topic uh, and a useful one, and um, I appreciate that you're doing three uh, actual uh, sessions revolving around the topic because um, it takes a lot to unpack it, and, uh, and yet it's not rocket science. And I, I also often feel uh, the need at the outset of these presentations to confess that I'm not a trained evaluator. Uh, much of what I know and can share is the result of having a lot of opportunity to connect with evaluators and researchers, uh, but also with artists and arts professionals who bring a lot to the table through their experience, even though they too will often confess that they're not experts in this world. So um, today we're taking up the question, what makes Arts for Change work excellent? Uh, my plan is to introduce you to the framework as a tool that can help you describe uh, and assess artistic aspects of Arts for Change. I'm going to give some context for um, how and why it came to be, and we'll actually walk you through it a bit. Um, and then uh, finally, oops, am I hearing some feedback? Are you hearing feedback? Okay, sounds good. Um, so I'll, I will also um, uh, spend a little bit of time at the end talking about how we have come to know others are using the framework uh, since it was released in May of last year. Uh, so I think with that, I will um, situate you a little bit with Animating Democracy, which is uh, approaching 20 years old. Uh, our work over all of that time has really been around strengthening the role of arts and culture in these spheres that you see at the bottom here, um, community development, civic engagement, social change, and justice. Uh, we intentionally take a wide lens, a, a wide view of how arts can integrate into these other spheres and really help to bolster the work of community, civic, and social change. Uh, so, um, so when I use the word arts or the phrase arts for change, that's uh, sort of the, the spectrum that we're we're looking at. Uh, I also um, find that the early years of our work, when we had a lab that was supporting 36 or so organizations around the U.S that were experimenting with arts and civic dialogue, um, that these examples continue to resonate for me uh, as um, ways, ways into understanding the work and describing it and, uh, and assessing it. So I'm going to share three projects that, um, that we did support with Ford Foundation money in our early years and, and sort of uh, draw them into our discussion of the aesthetics framework as we go. So uh, the first one is a Flint Youth Theater in Flint, Michigan. They did a theater-based dialogue project that was catalyzed by a local school shooting that took place not long after Columbine. And the play um, and a lot of related activities were designed to get community members, uh, including leaders, uh, social service organizations, children, to really talk about the causes and effects of youth violence. Uh, but the aesthetic questions that were at the core of, of this project were how to think anew about the process of creating the play, uh, My Soul to Take, so that it would ensure both power and authenticity on stage and also um, sort of maximize the potential that the play could motivate action in the community. This project uh, was a restoration project of a statue of King Kamehameha I on the Big Island of Hawaii. 
and um, it's a really interesting project. The question at hand aesthetically was how to restore this statue, which the community over more than 100 years had come to, to paint uh, over the bronze and gilding of the original artist's work in order to make it more lifelike and to feel closer to the spirit of Kamehameha, who was born on um, on the big island and, and was revered as the, the great unifier of the Hawaiian Islands. Uh, so this question um, was kind of also situated in a, a much larger question about heritage preservation uh, and also um, tourism development on the big island of, of Hawaii. Uh, so the aesthetic questions were, you know, how to, uh, how to restore this, this project uh, but also, um, in terms of the civic question, it was about um, honoring cultural forms and norms that would bring the voices of native and longtime residents on the island who were not per particularly uh, coming out for the sort of typical community town meeting forums. Uh, and so um, this, this project had many facets that uh, led up to the final restoration uh, of the statue. And then the Ties That Bind project uh, in San Jose, California was based at Makla, a contemporary art space, uh, and it engaged two local artists, one Asian and the other Latina, to de uh, develop a, a photo collage exhibition about Asian-Latino intermarriage in the Silicon Valley. And the hope was that this exhibition would open up dialogue about contemporary perceptions of ethnic identity. Um, they used ethnographic methods. Um, Makla actually collected 45 family case studies from families in the valley. And the artists engaged 15 of those families to um, uh, elicit oral histories and, uh, and to work with them around images that they wanted to convey through the exhibition. In creating the art for this project, um, the kinds of questions that were raised were, how does the intent to foster civic dialogue actually affect aesthetic choices? And by whose standards do we judge excellence in art with social intent? So um, in the early years of animating democracy, our focus was really on well, you know, what does this work look like, this intersectional work of arts? And, and in those years, civic dialogue was the focus. What makes that work work? What makes it effective? And how do arts and culture create an invitation, a space for, uh, take the form of, or spark dialogue in the public realm? Uh, we captured a lot of the answers to those questions, more or less, in some deep case study work, uh, which then morphed into a arts and civic engagement toolkit and workshops to advance practice in the field. Um, but what I would say that the question that we began to address but didn't fully address was, what difference are we actually making and how do we know? Uh, so, you know, I think in, in the arts, uh, we're really good at counting, and that's the easy thing to do. So people tend to default to numbers. Uh, but we all know that, that counting uh, who comes, how many people come, et cetera, et cetera, doesn't really tell much of a story, or at least it doesn't tell the whole story. Uh, we're also good at having high aspirations. Um, art saves lives. We can, through our arts program, reduce recidivism, uh, those kinds of, of proclamations. But often, they're really not realistic in the context of the scale of projects that we're doing. Uh, and certainly, um, there are many forces that uh, would have to contribute to changes those grant, that grand. So uh, we developed the continuum of impact uh, as a first tool to really help uh, cultural organizations, artists, uh, and their community partners to, to better articulate, to be more specific about the kinds of social and civic outcomes that they really were aspiring to and could um, literally track with evidence. So you see here along the squiggly line there um, six families of outcomes that have to do with changes in knowledge. Uh, what people understand or are aware of around particular issues, 
how people might be communicating in the public sphere through dialogue or deliberation, changes in attitudes, uh, changes in the capacity to be engaged in the, in the civic or social space of community, uh, changes in action or behavior, and changes in policies, uh, systems, uh, uh, structures, conditions, access equity. So um, this continuum was really intended to both capture what we were seeing commonly um, that arts folks were aspiring to uh, in their work, but uh, also where they are, are able to, um, to note change by looking for the right kind of evidence. So uh, I won't belabor this tool because next week's webinar with Barbara Schaefer Bacon will will really pick up on this in more detail, but the, but the continuum allows you to move through some uh, downloadable worksheets to really articulate outcomes, indicators, and the kinds of data that you might collect. Uh, and here are some ways that, uh, that the continuum can actually help you. So um, that is just a little bit of a long-winded uh, intro to um, what we're here to talk about which is the aesthetic perspectives framework. And, um, and this is really a companion to the continuum in that it is looking at the art side of the arts for change coin. Uh, it's looking at questions like what makes arts for change work potent and excellent as art and what aspects of the art or the, or the cu cultural practice are contributing to its civic or social effectiveness. So um, we, we really uh, had been listening to artists over you know, a decade or more, uh, and the concerns and frustrations, especially among those who are serious about uh, this kind of arts for change work. Uh, and the, the framework really evolved as a response to those concerns and frustrations. And there were essentially four of them, um, one that uh, uh, that there are standards of excellence for this work. Uh, I'll never forget um, Judy Baca, who's a mural artist in Los Angeles, uh, saying at one of our early meetings, you know, community members make critical judgments. They, they want to be part of something that has aesthetic value, and bad aesthetics in the name of, of good community work is really not acceptable. Uh, so stand, there are standards that, uh, that should uphold the best of this work. Um, second, too often art that lives at um, the intersection of change and justice is viewed as maybe creative social work, but not necessarily as art. And we wanted to elevate uh, and sort of reclaim the word aesthetics and elevate aesthetics as absolutely essential to effective work. Uh, in this work, which is uh, as much about creative process as engagement, and engagement as, as, as it is about product, um, where the art lies is, is often misunderstood, or, or maybe it's underappreciated. So we wanted to help people see that the creative process and the, the thinking that artists bring to bear in uh, community space uh, and in social space is, is is absolutely a part of this work and to, and to then convey what excellent process is. And then finally, and very importantly, um, we have observed, and I'm sure many of you have as well, that there's a strong aesthetic bias operating in uh, funding panels, in critical writing, in evaluation. Uh, and funders and panels and critics and evaluators often uh, default to dominant Eurocentric standards of excellence. They might be dismissing or ignoring or being uh, simply uh, not informed enough about standards that are relevant to different artistic and cultural practices. So uh, with these concerns foregrounded, uh, a couple of years ago we put together an evaluation learning lab, and we put artists in the driver's seat to, uh, to work on practical frameworks that really reflected the terms by which they want their work to be evaluated. And the aesthetic perspectives framework really simmered up as uh, the key framework that people got 
juiced about and, and were willing to work on. We had about 20 uh, artists and ally funders and evaluators who met over about 18 months uh, a few times, and then with a lot of work in between and after we concluded the, the, the lab, uh, a subgroup of uh, about six people worked hard to draft and craft the attributes uh, and the preface to the framework. And then we hit the road uh, for about a year and vetted uh, multiple drafts with about 150 people. So, uh, so this framework really evolved from a very field-oriented process of dialogue and um, excavation of, of what we mean by aesthetics in arts for change. So um, let's now just dig into the framework and uh, I'll share what's, what's actually in it. So what you'll find in the framework, and maybe some of you have actually looked at it online, uh, and I'll just mention briefly that it is available on Animating Democracy's website for free download uh, in multiple forms. So I suggest folks look at the full framework to be sure you're getting the, the, the meat of it uh, in full, but there are shorter versions and, and other iterations that you might find helpful. So there are 11 aesthetic attributes uh, at the center of, of the framework. And we, these are um, specifically identified by artists in the lab as relevant to arts and social justice work uh, and that represent both um, qualities of the work, aesthetic qualities of the work, and sort of values that underpin the work uh, and work that uh, they believe is aesthetically rich and effective in its social and civic uh, intent. So I'm, uh, I'm going to walk through one of these uh, attributes in a little bit of detail and then we'll kind of breeze through the other ones. Uh, so this one is openness and um, so uh, just by way of kind of describing what you'll find in the framework. Uh, there's a page on each attribute, and it begins with a sort of description, a pointed description that links that aesthetic attribute to uh, social change. So in this one, uh, we have openness, meaning that the creative work deepens impact by remaining open and fluid and transparent and subject to influence and able to hold contradiction. So um, this, this one I, I feel is a lot about uh, embracing and considering context of the work. Uh, so the things that, that are highlighted here are um, that there's, there's a sort of openness, meaning a fluidity between process and product, that, that uh, creators or programmers um, are allowing the creative work to evolve, to change based on uh, exchange or input with stakeholders and, um, and, and a, a, a context that might be revealing it over the course of, of development of the work. Uh, openness might also mean that the work has, uh, is accessible, that it has multi, multiple entry points where um, people can um, have uh, options for experiencing aesthetic elements and effects or maybe a cumulative series of experiences. Uh, that builds and results in, um, in communal meaning. Um, there's transparency around artistic choices and ethical use of community stories or other material uh, with the intention to level power and build trust. So I think about uh, Liz Lerman, who uh, was the founder of Liz Lerman Dance Exchange, uh, often saying that you know, in her process in community work, she uh, and the company are very much engaging community members in creating uh, movement phrases and exploring issues through movement uh, and drawing from that those experiences to, uh, to derive a, a piece, a, a, a staged piece. But she's very clear that at a certain point, the company takes over and builds the work from, from that material. So the transparency of, of their process is really, um, is really critical. So um, I'll just, you know, with the Kamehameha statue restoration, 
uh, I really feel that the conservator, Glenn Wharton, uh, was absolutely exercising a kind of openness in his process. Uh, he, you know, uh, the conservation field has an ethic, a code of ethics that uh, actually requires that conservators restore work as close as possible to the artist's original intent. And uh, in this case, he remained open to the possibility that the community aesthetic of painting this statue uh, over time in order to, again, feel closer to the spirit of Kamehameha was an, a really essential dimension of why this particular artwork had meaning in the community. And so um, that openness to community wisdom and knowledge and cultural connection um, was really important. Uh, so um, I think that this is a, it's an interesting attribute. It's one that people often have a little bit of challenge in kind of uh, making a connection to. Uh, so I, I thought I would start with this one. Uh, so uh, what you'll see on a page uh, for each of the attributes is this description at the top. And then a series of reflective questions. Uh, and these questions are sort of the heart and soul of the framework in that they're meant to kind of prompt uh, inquiry uh, amongst people who are perhaps in the developmental stages of a creative project or, or work. Uh, they're meant to prompt in inquiry in the assessment of the work uh, perhaps at midpoints uh, to understand kind of where you're at uh, or at the end, did you actually get there? Uh, and so uh, they, some of them may be relevant to a project, some of them may not be. Uh, in this particular attribute of openness, uh, an example of a question is, how does openness align with social justice intentions of the project or of, of the partners who are part of the project? Uh, but there are many others here. And then finally, uh, for each attribute, there are one or two examples of projects that, uh, that we looked at uh, and that we felt ha had some um, dimension to them that really reflected that attribute in, in action. So uh, while I'm switching here to um, a walkthrough of, of, of the attributes uh, beyond openness, uh, I just want to say that uh, as we, we go through these, um, I welcome you to think about, as we hit each one, maybe there's a, a creative project or some organizational work that you do that sort of comes to mind uh, around that attribute. And please, you know, use the chat box to just, you know, throw something out there. Uh, maybe there's a way that an attribute really resonates for you or not in relation to your own work and you might wish to uh, you might wish to um, uh, add that to the chat box. And uh, and then finally we find that sometimes uh, there are challenges uh, that they that the, the attributes pose, uh, questions that are raised, so I welcome those too. Uh, we're going to go through about five of these and then uh, take a break and, and open up for a few questions and then we'll continue on. So uh, commitment, uh, many consider commitment a sort of fundamental attribute that looks at the seriousness of intent uh, around and accountability to the social or civic concern that might be at hand in the work. This one uh, says, you know, it's not enough to be motivated by passion and aspiration. It asks, how are creative practices supported by knowledge and intention? Uh, and that's in order to create work that's, that's potent and grounded in an understanding of context, history, and relationships. So this one is uh, considered by many folks sort of to be the, the, the ground level, you know, if there, if there isn't a strong commitment and embodied in the work uh, around the change notion and, and how you express that creatively, then, uh, then there may be other challenges that will come to the fore. Uh, disruption. Art challenges what is by exposing what has been hidden, 
uh, posing new ways of being and modeling new forms of action. So um, I'll go back to uh, uh, say, say, first of all, from the description that di disruption may relate to content, form, delivery of the work, um, and uh, in disrupting, the question is often asked, does the work actually offer alternatives to current conditions? In other words, disruption toward what end? So um, I'll go back to Flint U Theater, uh, which um, had always, has always been about disrupting the genre of youth theater. It was never about making conventional morality plays uh, as much youth theater uh, may be. But the artistic director, in the case of My Soul to Take, wanted to experiment with um, with a nonlinear kind of structure to the play and uh, an impressionistic, imagistic kind of style. Uh, he tapped the metaphor of the Pied Piper uh, and through a process drama uh, um, uh, process in advance of you know creating the work and drawing out the community to to, to, to talk about this, this shooting that had taken place, he listened to the voices of the children who said, why can't somebody do something? And that became a kind of uh, refrain in the, the theater piece itself. So the aesthetic investigation here was about the combination of these things and how uh, effectively they might bring forward different perspectives from the community on stage and stimulate dialogue and motivate action. I'm going to take up emotional experience and sensory experience as two attributes in the framework uh, that are most often thought about when people uh, think aesthetic experience. So um, we all know that art can evoke joy or anger uh, or sorrow or discomfort or any, any number of emotions. And we know that artists use sensory effects to amplify experience of the work. So the framework helps to connect these two attributes to change-making intentions of, of the work. Um, the, the project in, uh, in our example section that I really like that, uh, that hits on both of these is Naomi Natale's One Million Bones project, which uh, uses the power of visual scale and sensory experience to elicit emotional response uh, regarding issues of worldwide genocides. Uh, she, so just like imagine a million ceramic bones being created across the United States, and she may have even done this internationally, uh, by artists and activists and students. And imagine volunteers and members of the public uh, in Washington, D.C. on the National Mall, ceremonially placing those million bones on the mall and ultimately covering it to create a site of conscience to commemorate and honor victims and survivors of genocide. Naomi said uh, about the work, most of us will never view a mass grave, will never understand what a pile of human bones looks or sounds like. The act of making the bones provided a tactile and visceral connection to the issue for thousands of people. The act of laying bones in communion with other people proved intensely moving to people and helped them imagine the scale and the human tragedy of genocide. So, um, so these, these are, uh, these are uh, often um, attributes that give creative work its greatest power. Uh, among the inquiry questions for uh, emotional and sensory experience is does the creative work take a responsible approach to potential emotional response? Does it help people channel such emotions into healing or action? Uh, so, you know, just going back to Flint Youth Theater again, uh, because of the rawness of the community's uh, emotional state after the shooting, uh, the theater made the wise choice to actually wait a year before it took up this topic in a piece uh, that they would create. Uh, and they were um, very sensitive to the post-traumatic stress that might be 
uh, engendered by the work and worked very closely with dialogue facilitators who had skill and experience in creating safe space uh, for dialogue, uh, especially in uh, the context of trauma. And be before we, um, we take a break, and I hope the microphone is, is working okay at this point, uh, please pop up again if you uh, are not hearing me well. Uh, so well, before we take a break for questions uh, after cultural integrity, uh, I'll just quickly note that um, this one, uh, it, it reads, the creative work demonstrates integrity and ethical use of material with specific cultural origins and context. Um, with so much focus uh, in recent uh, years on, on issues of equity and cultural equity, uh, doing work that is um, drawing uh, from the, the creative and aesthetic and cultural strengths of previously underserved communities. Um, this, this attribute has gotten lots of discussion as we've taken the, the framework around the U.S. Uh, so, you know, at the heart of it is if the goal is, is justice, then truth, authenticity, and integrity are inherently important in the creative work. Uh, this attribute takes up um, aspects of cultural values and competence, ethical use of material, um, and specific cultural origins. Uh, and it asks questions like, have the artists and stakeholders analyze the relationships of power, privilege, and cultural context within the, the, the art making process and presenting the work. Uh, so um, I think at this point, Liz, if you're able to come on the line and uh, share any questions that might be in the chat box or any that you might have yourself, I would be happy to take some before we move on. Thank you so much, Pam. I'm just, I'm waiting for some questions. People, I think, are, are uh, being shy to, um, to pose some questions. Um, but it's really, I, I'm just, I'm, I'm fascinated by this one um, because, and especially um, in, in the discussion of um, the, um, the emotional experience. So prior to, to doing my work here at the foundation, I worked at a community arts organization in Toronto, and, and we were in residence in, in um, neighborhoods that were experiencing, um, in particular, quite a bit of, quite a bit of violence, and, and trauma was something that we dealt with on a regular basis. Um, and what strikes me, I mean, we would, of course, have conversations um, about this and about how to be um, really mindful of the uh, participants' emotional experience, um, but I, 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 I just love that this is um, this has been formalized, I guess, in within the context of a larger framework that's looking at community-engaged art, and then uh, next week looking at how we can translate this into um, talking about the social and, and civic um, impact. Thank you. Are uh, there any questions from the uh, participants of our webinar right now? You can send them to me or to everybody in the chat box. Great. Um, maybe I'll use this uh, the few minutes here to. Um, Cam, your voice has just dropped. Can oh. you just for a second, are you able to speak closer to? The yeah. Room? Is this better? Perfect. Okay. Great. Um, I'll share with folks a, uh, a passage from uh, a blog that was writ written by Ananya Chatterjee from Ananya Dance Theater in Minneapolis. Uh, we did a blog salon last July, which is up on the Americans for the Arts website if folks are interested. And, um, and she was talking about, uh, well, I'll, I'll just read what she says because she says it better than I can. Uh, she says, what will be crucial for the long-term effectiveness of this framework is that it's seen comprehensively as positing a set of indicators of excellence whose success is in the chemistry of their juxtaposition. So for instance, uh, it's only when risk-taking 
is assessed in relationship with cultural integrity and communal meaning, those three attributes, that we can uh, avoid producing art that's cool, ironic, critiquing state power, but lacks consideration of how aesthetic choices might affect an already vulnerable community connected to an issue. Think, for instance, about the recent turmoil created by the installation of visual artist Sam Durant's scaffold, a large structure made of gallows in the Walker Art Center's sculpture garden. The pieces reference to the gallows used to execute 38 Dakota men in 1862 uh, deeply insulted and outraged the Native community. Scaffolds certainly offered disruption and provocation, but at the cost of tremendous pain to the community who are indigenous to Minnesota. So um, I, I, we have found that um, you know uh, when we do workshops around the framework and we have them all up, all the attributes up around the wall, uh, sort of randomly. Sometimes people are stimulated to see the connections between these these different attributes and how they interplay in projects uh, in a in a very rich and um, and sometimes very complicated way. Pam, thank you um, for elaborating on that example. That's a really uh, that's a really potent one here in the Canadian context too. I just had a couple of questions, one comment and um, and a question come up. I, I was hoping I could read out right now. Sure. So um, one one comment coming from uh, an art service or as an art service organization, I see how some of these attributes can guide our work in achieving change within the art sector. For example, disruption is key in challenging the status quo. Um, and then a question um, asking for you to talk a bit more about what was involved in putting people in place who are experienced in PTSD and trauma in the Flint play that you referenced. Um. There were, there were, so uh, Flint Youth Theatre collaborated with what at the time was called Study Circles Resource Center. Uh, now it's called Everyday Democracy, but this is a, a dialogue organization that uh, works in a lot of different contexts. And they also put together a, a coalition of um, service organizations in the community, including neighborhood associations. Uh, uh, and others that were uh, helpful at the time of the shooting, working with kids and so forth. Uh, so um, in the development of the project, uh, the, um, the artistic director of Flint Youth Theatre worked with another theatre artist, Jillian Eaton, to do process dramas that, um, uh, that engaged through those various partner organizations uh, the widest spectrum of the community that had been um, connected to this issue, and then beyond that to you know what we might call the general public. Um, and in the process drama uh, scenarios, they they were carefully uh, exploring with a kind of um, uh, artistic device of distance the the kinds of um, uh, uh, concerns and emotional uh, uh, experiences that people had through um, throughout that period of the, the aftermath of the shooting and then beyond. So there was a lot of pre-work uh, to really engage with people who were affected by the issue. And then with Study Circles Resource Center, the dialogues that took place before and after the play, and literally weeks before and weeks after, as well as immediately after, uh, there was a lot of attention to how to create a comfortable space, an intimate space for conversations, uh, and ways for people to process uh, what might still be uh, raw emotional experience. Great, thank you. Uh, thanks for um, responding to that. And the, the poser of that question said that was very helpful. Um, I have another another question here. Um, some of the truth and reconciliation work that we do follows strict cultural integrity ethics, 
and relies on strong emotional experiences that create an awareness and an urgency for the need to take action. However, for other change areas that aren't related to social change, I'm finding harder to translate this, uh, these attributes to our work. It occurs to me that much of our um, open mind programs lack emotional and sensory experiences. That was a, a comment coming from uh, someone here we have from an art service organization. So do I understand correctly that, uh, that the work that's less connected to truth and reconciliation uh, is, is the work that's not demonstrating so much emotional and sensory experience? Uh, no, it was for other change areas that aren't related to social change. He, ah. He's finding okay. it harder to translate the attributes to his particular work as an art service organization. Mm -hmm. Well, they may not all always work. So uh, I would say that, um, you know, the framework was actually created by artists who do uh, social change and community change kind of work because they were finding some gaps in, uh, in what exists out there. Uh, so, so it may not always apply. Uh, I, I would say that <clears throat> as we've been out and about with the framework that, uh, that the, bro the broader lens uh, is often community engagement. So uh, for example, the Kohler Art Center in Sheboygan, Wisconsin, uh, looked at the framework and said, you know, we do, we, we support a lot of community-based work in our, in our community, but we're not sure that it's always that great, uh, that it's, uh, it has shortcomings and that our own, uh, our own understanding and our own guidelines might be falling short as well. So uh, they, their intention, although I don't know if they've actually done this yet, was to take the framework and use it as a kind of internal tool to um, themselves kind of test their own support system uh, for, for past work and say, you know, which of these projects hit the mark, which of these projects are falling short, and in what areas. Uh, and that might be a route to both staff training and uh, a way of rearticulating some some guidelines around community engagement. So in their context, as I understood it, social change or social justice uh, wasn't necessarily the end goal, uh, but that some level of community engagement was, um, was the intention. That's a really helpful example, example Pam. Thank you. Okay, I might suggest that we uh, continue on, and I'm just going to do my own quick time check here. Um, so we'll move on to risk taking, and um, this is a you know this is a term that we see a lot in arts grant guidelines. Uh, risk taking, yes, indeed, uh, in whether it's in creating work or programming choices or uh, the ways that we connect art with audiences can uh, actually allow new possibilities to develop. This attribute looks at what risk, uh, why risk, and whose risk, because uh, we know that risk can be um, uh, a factor for the artists, uh, the, it can be a factor for participants or audience members, and it can be a factor for institutional players. Uh, and I know that many of you may represent uh, cultural institutions, so I thought I would um, draw in a project from our early years, again, the Jewish Museum in New York and its exhibition of uh, Mirroring Evil, uh, which featured work by young artists who were generations removed from the Holocaust. Uh, and the museum took, I, I would say, curatorial and institutional risks by um, dramatically shifting the common focus on representing Holocaust victims to representing the perpetrators uh, behind the Holocaust. Uh, and the work was uh, quite transgressive. Um, uh, examples were uh, by one artist, a bust of Mengele, uh, Lego concentration camp, um, film, old film footage manipulating sound bites from Hitler's speeches. 
so the, the, the exhibition was potentially one that would alienate even the museum's core audience, uh, never mind gener generate uh, public controversy, which uh, in fact, it unfortunately did through a, uh, an unfortunate um, uh, newspaper article. So the inquiry question I think that's very relevant in the, this context is what, what's the point of risk taking when you're aiming to, uh, to create um, some sort of civic or social or justice oriented change. And for the Jewish Museum this was a bold and uh, a calculated show that it hoped would broaden the relevance of the Holocaust to more people by linking it and looking at it through the broader lens of, of complicity and complacency in, uh, in mass atrocities that the world faces today. So linking history to contemporary concerns and issues. Uh, it also wanted to attract a younger museum audience who are less connected by time and direct experience to the, to the Holocaust. So um, building understanding and building a connection with younger museum goers to, to the museum. Uh, knowing that there was a lot of risk behind this institutionally, uh, the museum took a lot of different measures both internally uh, in terms of bringing staff and board up to up to uh, speed and in dialogue about the intentions externally through communications and the interpretive programs and the dialogue activities and the framing of the ex exhibition, um, all of these things were extremely carefully designed to um, mitigate against um, against the kind of risks that that they knew they were taking in doing this project. Uh, coherence, strong ideas expressed with clarity advance both artistic and social purposes. Uh, coherence may be evident in how parts of a creative work relate to the whole of, of a project that it's a part of. It might uh, manifest in the overall impression that the work makes. Uh, and, you know, kind of fundamental question among the inquiry questions is, is there a meaningful connection between medium and message? Uh, communal meaning. Uh, the creative work facilitates collective meaning that transcends individual perspectives and experience. So there is a kind of ladder of change that obviously um, must embrace individual uh, changes or perceptions before communal changes might take place or communal meaning might uh, take hold. Uh, and this, this uh, attribute sort of excavates that. So um, I'll bring back the Makwa exhibition about intermarriage in the Silicon Valley. Um, we did a, a critical writing experiment around this project. Uh, and supported Makla to invite four different writers to write about the project and the creative work from various vantage points. And this was an experiment that was sort of um, uh, counter to the typical single authoritative voice of critical writing and really trying to do a more multi-vocal um, critical reflective writings around the work. So uh, we had an occasion to bring the writers together uh, and as they were in progress with their writing, um, there was this intriguing debate about excellence in this work. Uh, and you may remember from the slide uh, some small shadow or photo boxes, photo collages that were representative of the families in, in the valley. Uh, and some of the writers, you know, said, well, this work is, you know, it's nice. Uh, but it's kind of it's kind of uh, safe. Uh, it lacked an edge. Uh, they may have felt that the research phase and the oral histories tread a little bit too carefully, uh, so as not to reveal tensions within families. Uh, but when it came time for the exhibition itself, uh, Makwa was surprised at just how um, intensely the families engaged with the artwork and how, uh, as Renato Rosaldo, who is, is a cultural anthropologist and was one of the writers, he, um, he actually came around to say 
that he believes the blandness of the art, <laughs> the blandness, uh, that was one of the words the writers were were toying with, was precisely what made it so effective at, by creating a sort of soft and respectful space and reflection of the families, they then felt a comfort uh, in, in, conveying, uh, in, in conveying their tensions uh, in, in, the, in the marriages when they actually came into uh, dialogue amongst themselves. So um, this, this project uh, took that, quest, that, that word communal and really revisited it to raise the question, how public does the work actually have to be to be successful? And, uh, and then uh, offered the idea that intra-group dialogue was actually uh, a, a high benefit of projects in addition to, to the dialogues that happen between groups. Uh, stickiness, um, change obviously happens over time. And when creative work sticks, its influence lasts. And this, uh, in turn, might stir people to engage with the ideas behind the work, the issues, uh, movements, um, and at some point uh, really change behavior or attitudes uh, as a result. So, you know, the stickiness might come in the form of a, a powerful visual image or a musical hook or a phrase uh, that you remember, or an emotional response. Uh, so um, let me just get to the last one here, and then uh, we can uh, take a little bit of a turn in our last 15 minutes or so. So resourcefulness uh, is um, the imaginative use of available resources that drives artistic innovation and demonstrates responsible social and environmental practice. So uh, um, resourcefulness in terms of aesthetic considerations might have to do with the setting of, of the work, where it's cited, uh, it might have to do with repurposing materials, uh, but all in service of um, uh, amplifying or deepening the meaning of the work. Uh, it was interesting, uh, I had the occasion to sit in on a, a funding panel uh, in which the panel members had been um, invited or actually required to read the aesthetic perspectives framework uh, and to, um, with the intention that in their panel deliberations, uh, the framework would provide a kind of backdrop to deepen uh, their excavation and, and discussion of different proposals. And uh, in this panel, resourcefulness came up in terms of the solo performance genre, uh, and, and one person who is a, a practitioner of that said it's a really hard form to innovate. Uh, you're alone, and how many things can you do with it? Uh, to stimulate imagination, um, you know, he, he said the threshold to meet is to use the entire body and the body of experiences that you can draw from to evoke many bodies and many experiences. And I, I just bring that one forward because um, it opened up for me a whole different kind of context for, uh, for thinking about resourcefulness uh, in terms of a, a particular uh, creative genre. So um, I think I will uh, stop again and Liz, see if there are any new questions that have emerged on the screen. I do have a question. Um, Assessment of the artist's success in embodying some of these attributes is very subjective. How, how do you evaluate in this case? Uh, it's a great question. Um, you know, I think uh, the fact that we, um, we've, we've made the core of the framework these inquiry questions has the very intent behind it to encourage um, a kind of process that uh, engages not just one person's point of view, but multiple points of view. So, uh, so you know, you you might draw the some of the questions from the framework into a kind of focus group context 
uh, it could be like in the case of um, uh, complex movements and artist collectives in Detroit, they used uh, certain of the attributes and certain of the questions in an artist retreat uh, where, you know, the, for themselves, uh, each of them having their own uh, perhaps subjective perspective on the success of the work, uh, in, in consort uh, they could talk about uh, the things that they really wanted to, to hone in on. And I can share a little bit more about that um, in a second. So, you know, I don't know that there's a way to entirely guard against subjectivity. Uh, we shied away from uh, uh, the prospect of creating things like rubrics, although uh, I don't know that we would uh, dismiss that as a kind of iteration or a derivation of the framework at all. Uh, but, um, you know, we knew from the artists who were involved that from their perspective, having these kinds of uh, pointed questions was probably going to be more useful, whether it, they were deployed by fellow artists or um, funders or uh, critical writers uh, or evaluators, that they would open up the kind of um, depth of dialogue that could lead to uh, answers to questions like how successful was this work, or where did it fall short, or uh, what, were the, uh, what were the dimensions of the aesthetic experience that really um, made it potent. Uh, so it's a, it's a kind of multidimensional tool as opposed to kind of a, um, uh, a checklist, I guess is what I would say. I don't know if that's helpful or if you might have a comment back in relation to that. I, I think that's very helpful. Does the person who posed the question have any follow-up questions or? Uh, yes, she says, helpful to get away from the checklist idea. <laughs> All right, well, um, if there are no other questions, I can invite folks to think about the one that's on the screen, how might you apply the framework in your work. And, uh, you know, I would suggest um, thinking about uh, at describing work, uh, whether it's in your own writing, in interpretive materials, in uh, proposal development. Uh, I would suggest, you know, how can it promote understanding? Maybe it's in the context of teaching, if some of the folks on the phone are teaching artists or uh, in academia, uh, case making, um, working in partnership with folks who are less familiar with this realm of arts. Maybe it's a, you know, a cross-sector partner in the community, uh, possibly even, you know, engaging with media and critics uh, in grant review processes. Uh, and then, you know, how might it be helpful in your own evaluation work? Uh, and while folks are thinking about that question, um, I'll come back to the complex movements story. Um, so this artist collective in Detroit created a piece called Beware of the Dandelions. And um, this is a very super hybrid work. Uh, a it had three components, a performance, which was a combination of science fiction narrative, music, video projection, um, uh, interactive uh, spoken word uh, elements. A second component that was a video archive of oral histories uh, that appeared within this installation uh, uh, kind of environment. Uh, and the, the, the stories were about local movement building in various parts of the U.S. And then the third component was a, set, a series of workshops that uh, Complex Movements br brought out on the road with the installation, and they partnered with community activist organizations uh, who wanted to use the installation to support their own local cultural organizing efforts. So this is a complex project by Complex Movements, and. Um, and they really used, they, they seized the framework, unbeknownst to us, actually, uh, 
to um, to do some assessment uh, start for themselves as artists and then also with the community organizers who received the installation in their communities. And they, they used it because, A, they wanted to improve practice and future projects, and B, uh, they wanted to know how that touring model uh, really worked in the end uh, to support local organizers' interests. So uh, again, they did a debriefing amongst themselves. They looked in particular at coherence uh, because they knew that the work was a dense, a dense work. There was a lot going on, uh, almost an overwhelming amount of information coming at participants at one time, and all of these different sort of spectacular uh, technical effects. Um, but they really wanted to understand was the message of Beware of the Dandelions clearly transmitting within this work that was uh, pretty disconcertingly um, loud and visual and had a lot of spatial uh, kinds of things going on. So, um, you know, they took some questions from the framework. In what ways did audiences and participants find meaning in both the parts of this, this complex project and the whole of it? And in the end, they, they simply reframed another question, did we sacrifice artistic for social purpose? Uh, they really felt that um, the framework in their own retreat helped them to structure the debrief and they got deeper and faster and felt like it lent some rigor to um, what was before then a sort of um, off-the-cuff kind of process. And then they took um, uh, questions from the framework to create an interview protocol with the community organizing partners that hosted the national tour, and they sent those questions in advance to um, to those organizers, uh, did phone phone call focus groups, uh, and um, and really found by looking at the sensory experience and a few of the other questions uh, that the video stories, the ones of the organizers uh, from throughout the country, which were pretty straightforward elements of the whole installation in fact were had the higher value in terms of what the organizing partners' interests and goals were. So uh, this suggested to the complex movement artists that they might need to create more balance in future work. So it was really um, something that they um, uh, that they seized and, and ran with uh, that helped them think about uh, the effectiveness of the work. I'll just mention quickly, um, funders are, are picking up on the framework. Uh, I mentioned the, the MAP Fund in uh, New York, which funds performing arts nationally, is integrating the framework into panel process uh, in a larger effort with other funders to look at bias in panel processes and who's not getting funded because the criteria are not uh, um, uh, broadly relevant to uh, Arts for Change work. Uh, the Native Arts and Culture Foundation in the Northwest U.S. Uh, used it in evaluation of the pilot for its Community Inspirations Program, which funded Native artists doing social justice work. Uh, C4 Atlanta, uh, an artist service organization, uh, is using it to um, uh, to develop a curriculum unit for community-based practice uh, that it will be launching in the fall. Uh, so there are many um, percolations, I would say, of, of uh, ways that people are beginning to use the framework. I'll mention uh, quickly in relation to, uh, to use that uh, there are several companion guides written by folks in different parts of the art fields uh, to help kind of uh, center their thinking around how the framework might be applicable in their work. So I encourage you to go to the website uh, and, and download any one of these, and we hope to continue to build a few more uh, from other perspectives. And then I'll just close by uh, kind of saying that, um, you know, there's the danger once you put something on paper that it becomes the next codification uh, that people may bristle against, and, and we've had that reaction too. But we like to underscore that, um, that these, these are not meant to be 
uh, the new buzzwords, they're meant to augment standard vocabulary of aesthetics uh, with qualities that are relevant to social change work. Uh, not all of them will apply to every work. Some may have greater relevance. Uh, con conventional attributes may still apply uh, in arts for change work and uh, that these attributes will uh, definitely uh, evolve, uh, we're sure, over time with the benefit of field discussion and application. So um, my parting thought is that if folks do pick up on the framework and tap it in any way, we're really curious and really welcome uh, both your positive and negative experiences with it so that we can learn and, um, and maybe continue to evolve it as time goes on. So uh, that was incredible. Thank you. Um, I'm just here we go. I had one comment come in at the end um, from, uh, from someone from an, an incredible community engaged theater organization I know up in Northern Ontario who said that they could see it as uh, using it as a project um, as a project is evolving, so developmental evaluation, as well as looking back at a project that they've just completed uh, with their artists, with participants, and also using it with an eye to influencing policy related uh, to the work. Fantastic. Well, I hope you'll share what your experience might be. That's great. Thank you. So thank you so much, Pam. Um, as we wrap up here, I just wanted to show uh, people, um, again, go back to this slide about the Knowledge Center. Um, really, really incredible work that you've done, Pam, and it, you've inspired uh, so much thinking um, on this topic. And I want to invite people to um, go to our Knowledge Center because I've actually, um, in the Inspire People Hub and the Knowledge Center, I've set up a place where we can continue this conversation. Um, it would be great to hear how people see um, using the framework in their work. Um, what, what questions is this bringing up for you in your work? You'll see there are some questions there. And Pam, I'm hoping that maybe um, you can keep an eye on this too, and, and if people have some questions, maybe they could ask them uh, a few there. Sure. Um, so in order to comment on the Knowledge Center, you'll just need to sign up as a new user, um, go to the list of discussion topics, and you'll see a discuss discussion topic called Post-Webinar Discussion, What Makes Art for Change Work Excellent. Um, I've just put a couple of questions up there, a couple of questions. What resonates for you in the aesthetics uh, perspective framework, how might you apply this framework to your work, and, and what questions are coming up for you as you think about applying it in your work? Um, so last thing, we have two upcoming uh, Knowledge Center webinars, so really, really excited. As Pam mentioned, um, the, the follow-up to this webinar, you may be asking yourself, so how do I, how do I apply this in the context of evaluation? Well, I think that um, the next, next week's webinar will really help you with this. How do arts and culture make a difference? And Pam's colleague Barbara, who I think is listening on the line today, is going to be leading that, um, that webinar where, the, where she'll be presenting the How Do Arts and Culture Make a Difference um, Continuum of Impact um, uh, tool. Um, and at the end of May, we've got um, some guests from the International Center for Art for Social Change joining us to introduce their Art for Social Change Evaluation Toolkit. Um, and uh, some of you may be familiar with um, Judith Marcuse out on the West Coast and the work that she's doing there. And this is um, part of a larger um, shirk funded project that she has done there. So um, that brings us to the end. I want to thank everybody for joining us today. And I also I want to thank you, um, Pam, for, for introducing this toolkit um, to a Canadian audience. Um, we're really, really thrilled that you could join us today and share. Totally my pleasure. Thank you for having me. Really appreciate it. Fantastic. Okay, well, folks, I hope that you continue this conversation um, on the Knowledge Center. And for those of you who can join us next week, I look forward to having you next week. Take care.